I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit today about uh, stereo EEG or uh, stereo electroencephalography. Um, but first, let's see, I have no disclosures, none whatsoever. Um, uh, epilepsy, uh, we should all, uh, certainly as neurosurgeons, anyone that's uh, seen anyone with epilepsy, um, we should uh, know this paper um, by Quan et al. Um, and just talking about um, how patients respond to medications. Um, if we're seeing these patients, it may be because of trauma, maybe because of an epilepsy evaluation, but um, epilepsy is very common, and um, this paper uh, really uh, puts into perspective how many of these patients are going to be um, uh, are going to fail medical therapy. So if you have one drug, uh, about 47 people will be controlled after that. And then uh, you can see that the uh, percentage of people that respond to medication drops precipitously uh, as you add medications. Um, as you see these patients, you look at a history, um, and often they'll have been on multiple, you know, five, six, eight medications, whether for side effects uh, and or failure. Uh, but uh, a large portion of these patients, no matter what you put them on, um, and after that third uh, medication, the chance that they're going to respond is exceedingly low. So about a third of people uh, will be uncontrolled on medications. Um, so then that, what are other options? Are other options or, or surgery? Um, uh, and what are the goals in surgery? Well, the goals in surgery are to cure people's epilepsy, um, and how do we do that? And we do that uh, by addressing the epilepticogenic area. Um, and that's the difficult part uh, for in surgery and in the evaluation uh, by epileptologists and surgeons is where is that area? Uh, you can see here, oh nice. So um, this would be a, a scenario and there's a, a failure. Um, so you see there, there's the actual seizure onset or the epileptogenic area. Um, and then you have a, say, a partial resection of that. Uh, and yet um, you have not resected the entire area causing those seizures and you have a failure uh, in your surgery. On the other hand, um, we know that if you can uh, identify uh, and then address with either resection or now with Dr. Gomez speaking about uh, stimulation, uh, you can prevent these seizures from happening. But the difficult part um, is not necessarily the surgery itself or uh, putting your lead in for RNS, but is finding what patients um, can we target and uh, uh, with a focal resection or treatment and where exactly is this area. So any workup, um, this is uh, very standard. Uh, so it's your phase one workup. This is certainly... Um, uh, the most extensive workup in all of neurosurgery. Um, when you go and uh, see a patient in clinic who comes to uh, speak with you about the next step, um, the amount of time and resources that have gone into acquiring the information to try and locate seizure onset often is, is staggering. Um, the, uh, I would say certainly one of the things that I appreciated, especially being here uh, and seeing these patients, is you really have to um, really tease out the semiology and really go into the history about uh, how the seizures, um, uh, what the quality of those seizures are, what type of seizures, if there's any aura, that being important, and that's the first sign uh, that the patient's having that something's happening, and that may give you a clue as uh, far as uh, what part of the brain um, is actually being affected. Um, and uh, your video EEG, your EEG, uh, your electrical information, often your EEG may tell you frontal temporal onset and the laterality, but the um, specific onset uh, or the accuracy of a scalp EEG to locate um, to um, isolated anatomy if uh, there's no lesion there is limited. Um, additional imaging, uh, we have to uh, make sure this is concordant with um, the patient's semiology and putting the whole picture together to try and find out where the seizures are coming from. So what happens after phase one testing? A couple things can happen. Um, you can continue medical therapy. Sometimes people will go through the workup, they're tolerating their medications okay, there's not a clear cause, and they just go back and, and uh, continue their medications. Perhaps um, they're not ready for additional uh, workup. They're very busy. They may be having seizures that aren't interrupting that. And so um, they continue. And, and they can come in and out. And you'll see people have video monitoring. Um, and then they kind of go back to their life and, and uh, kind of um, muddle through. Uh, the other scenario are patients that come in, their semiology is classic for, say, temporal lobe epilepsy, non-dominant. They have an MRI. They have mesial temporal sclerosis. Those patients are surgical candidates. They don't need 
phase two monitoring to tell you that that's where their seizures are coming from. So those patients can go right to seizure, uh, surgical treatment. Others would be, say, someone that has medically refractory epilepsy and has multifocal onset, generalizes very quickly. Those patients might be, say, a candidate for directly to go to VNS. But then there's phase two testing, which is your intracranial monitoring. And so when do we do that? What patients are appropriate for that? And so uh, depending on what you read, you'll look at, there's no set scenario, but um, I thought all these, um, these were the ones that made sense made sense is if people have um, uh, their MRI negative where you don't see uh, necessarily any lesion on their imaging. And so um, you may be able to match um, their semiology with their clinical data, uh, but their MRI is negative. And so you want to confirm that that's where you think the seizures are coming from are actually coming from that area. Well, what about where your electrical data or your, say your video EG shows all left frontal onset but then your MRI shows a right frontal um, cav mal or um, uh, focal cortical dysplasia. Well, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So you wouldn't know how to treat those patients. So those patients would be a candidate for um, intracranial monitoring. Others would be multiple lesions um, or a very large lesion. Someone that has a um, um, uh, either uh, multiple focal cortical dysplasias or um, periaqueductal gray matter, uh, or nodule heterotopias, rather, uh, you wouldn't necessarily know which one to target. Um, some people are working with um, PET for um, tuber tubers and tuberous sclerosis to see which one's the active lesion. So um, in that scenario, that would be a patient that would qualify for intracranial monitoring. And then um, if there's a, an area that involves um, a uh, eloquent area, um, where exactly is the border of that onset of the seizure? Uh, or where is the, um, say, especially with speech, uh, if that needs to be mapped, you would think about, say, a grid for intracranial monitoring. So our options are um, strips, uh, grids, uh, and strips, or subdural electrodes. Certainly, um, you can do epidural, uh, or you can read about them. I don't know anybody that does that. You, certainly, it makes it into the textbooks, but I don't know anybody that does that. Um, so really, it's subdural electrodes. Um, or depth electrodes, or some combination of those. Certainly the more common, uh, uh, when I started in residency, uh, it was not uncommon uh, for us to do a, a grid and then uh, temporal or hippocampal depth or Spencer depth electrode. Um, not uncommon at all. Um, but what's uh, the technique that we want to talk about today, and what's really, um, while this is an old technique, we'll go into some of the history, uh, it's really, in the last 10 years, um, it's amazing, actually, how quickly this is spread across, really, North America. Um, and what the technique is, it's stereoelectroencephalography. And it's a technique of using multiple, multiple depth electrodes. It can be, there's no set number, but uh, usually anywhere from 8 to, say, 15. You can always put more, but probably 8 to 15. And you're doing individualized implantations. So you're coming up with a hypothesis from your phase one trial about where you think those seizures are coming from. Whether it's um, a lesion you see, whether it's uh, the limbic circuit, whether it's um, mesial frontal or, um, or the um, posterior quadrant. And then you're using those electrodes to then map out in 3D where the seizure is starting and where is it spreading to. And how does that relate to the electrical activity and the clinical onset. And so you'll see often the anatomo-electroclinical correlation. So you're tying all those things together with stereo EEG. And then um, what it also does is it allows you to um, record from uh, the entire length of the electrode. If you look and imagine, if you put a subdural grid on this area, you would be, say, recording from just the surface of each gyri here. But if you notice, in this depth electrode, you're measuring or you're recording all, all of these contacts at, say, the lateral frontal lobe, uh, the depths of each of these sulci, and then the mesial temporal lobe, which would be very difficult to get to if you had, a, um, say, an inner hemispheric uh, you'd have to put an inner hemispheric grid in um, along with strips. So it allows you to map out the entire area with um, multiple electrodes. Here you can see a patient already in the operating room. Oops, sorry. 
with uh, only four. So that would be a, a rather limited survey, but uh, certainly uh, then you're able to record along that entire uh, length of, say, the frontal lobe or parietal lobe or wherever that is. And um, much of the white matter tracks also uh, today, seizures are, are, uh, are the ability for a seizure to spread. Um, I was reading about um, some of the studies they had done where they were doing complete callosotomies, and even those patients would have seizures spread to the contralateral side uh, along the uh, deep structures. And so um, with stereo EG, you're, you're not only mapping out lobes or isolated um, of structures, you're mapping out entire networks. And so um, uh, you need to understand, um, one, how the different parts of the brain are linked in order to predict and make your hypothesis and detect your seizure uh, spread and, and onset and then spread. So um, the creator or the um, um, person that discovered or first described uh, this technique is uh, Jean Talirac. Uh, he uh, lived from 1911 to 2007. He uh, originally was a psychiatrist uh, in Paris. Uh, he practiced in uh, St. Anne Hospital, and uh, he was very interested in psychosurgery. He said psychosurgery is too important to be left to the neurosurgeons. Uh, so he uh, became a neurosurgeon, and uh, he became head of the um, Department of Stereotactic Surgery. Uh, most of his, he developed his own stereotactic frame, uh, which you have there. Oops, still getting used to this. Apologize. He developed his own stereotactic frame. Um, and he used this for mostly movement disorders and psychosurgery. Um, but then when L-DOPA uh, came out, he directed his attention from um, uh, movement disorder to epilepsy uh, because there was quite a bit of, at that time, there was still quite a bit of overlap between psychiatry and um, epilepsy, especially mesial temporal epilepsy. Sometimes these were uh, diagnosed as anxiety disorders or something of that nature, which they still are occasionally. Um, so then he partnered with um, the... Uh, uh, neurologist Sean Bucode, and uh, yeah, the first actual uh, surgery was in 1957, and then he published in 1962. Um, in order to do this, he would have his uh, frame there, and uh, they would obviously there's no CT scan. Uh, you could do pneumoencephalogram to get your ACPC, uh, but he would actually do a an angiogram um, within. Um, with the patient in the frame to identify the vessels and then avoid those vessels. But you can see uh, that trajectory, which you do see in, in some centers where it's uh, straight in. Uh, it's amazing uh, that they don't uh, hit anything, um, but uh, we'll go into that. So uh, this is a technique that was uh, discovered and described in 1962 in France and really stayed in Europe and mostly Italy and France um, until probably about 10 years ago. Um, here, most of the expertise, most of the papers of centers that are doing it or were doing this on a regular basis were all French and Italian. And then um, the group, uh, especially uh, Dr. Gonzalez Martinez, uh, started publishing um, early, or I'm sorry, around 2010, started uh, publishing out of the Cleveland Clinic and has really uh, done an amazing job about spreading this technique in North America, um, advocating for it, teaching, putting on courses. Um, and so uh, a lot of the expertise in North America um, has come out of Cleveland Clinic. So what is the preoperative workflow? Well, we've already talked about our phase one um, workup. This is where you um, will get all of your information to come up with your clinical or your hypothesis. Um, the imaging required is uh, pretty standard. MR, uh, MRI, uh, I'm sorry, MRI, brain T1 with contrast, and um, the with contrast is, is simply because of the vessels. Um, this procedure, what you're targeting, you can see the amygdala, the hippocampus. Likely you'll see um, uh, focal cortical dysplasias or heteotopias, but what you have to see uh, are the vessels. Um, most centers will get a CT angiogram that then you will then uh, blend in with your uh, MRI uh, to assist uh, in your planning of your trajectories. Trajectory planning, once again, this has to be um, focused. It has to be, um, it can't, uh, it has to be individualized to the patient uh, and where you think those seizures are coming from. This is a very accessible um, or easy to um, have mission creep, uh, what we call where we, if you don't start with a very focused hypothesis of where the seizures are coming from, all of a sudden you can start um, going from, well, we'll do a unilateral survey, 
maybe we'll do a bilateral survey and um, all of a sudden um, you uh, are trying to cover as much as possible. Um, but uh, if you don't have a very focused hypothesis, uh, you're not going to answer a question. Um, and so um, it really has to, the pre, before you get into the operating room is where the important work is done. Um, when you do your targeting, uh, if you have multiple lesions, you want to target those lesions. Uh, if you're going to target, if you say, want to answer the question, is this patient having temporal lobe epilepsy? You want to target um, the structures uh, where there'd be onset where you'd have pseudo temporal lobe epilepsy. You want to target the insula, posterior cingulate, orbital frontal, um, uh, because those areas you will not see electrical activity necessarily on your um, scalp EEG. And because the seizure per spread can be so quick, um, you may not see that in semiology either. So you need to know um, what the mimics are of certain seizure types and then cover those. The intraoperative workflow. These are always done under general anesthesia. You, the uh, frame is placed or um, whatever uh, device, if you're using, uh, say, a vario guide, um, you can use just the radiolucent um, skull clamp. Uh, the, this is a technique that has gone hand in hand and really promoted the use of robotics. And the reason for that is uh, the robots, if uh, this is the top there is uh, the Neuromate Renishaw, and there's the Rosa, which is probably, you are probably more familiar with. We have one of those here today. Um, robotics is, have been around in neurosurgery uh, for decades, but there hasn't been a huge application for them. Um, it seems that, or it doesn't seem, but really stereotactic uh, techniques are the most likely to take advantage of this uh, just because it's not, um, uh, it's about very fine measurements and, and very consistent measurements as opposed to um, a technique of, say, clipping an aneurysm or something of that sort. The problem with it before the um, popularity of SEG is Lexel frame is a very powerful tool. And if you're putting in two leads, the advantage of using the Lexel frame to, say, a Rosa is pretty minimal. Um, but if you have to change the coordinates on your Lexel frame 15 times, all of a sudden your um, one and a half hour surgery with your Rosa robot turns into an eight hour surgery uh, with multiple chances for mistakes and measurements. I'm not sure how many of you all have done DBS, but how many times have you made a mistake where you thought it was your X was say 45 or you put it at 46 um, and the robot doesn't do that. Um, but um, so uh, it, this is a technique that goes hand in hand with robotics. Um, we start, once you have your trajectory planned, you come in to um, bring the uh, either flexible arm or, or robotic arm into place to a stab incision. Uh, and then you're using a 2.5 millimeter uh, drill bit to drill through the skull. Some of the software, you can actually plan your drilling um, along where you just hub the drill and you're a millimeter down others, you have to actually, it's a field technique where you're uh, feeling to where you're through um, uh, the inner table, the skull. Uh, and then um, you come out uh, and uh, you place your bolt, which we'll do today, and that's going to give you your trajectory, move your stereotech equipment out of the way, uh, pierce the dura, measure to your uh, target, and then um, place your electrode. This is very quick. You can see there uh, that is a patient that has their electrodes in place. Uh, that patient had already had a craniotomy. We'll talk about that as well, but um, this is also a, a, an excellent technique. If someone's already had a craniotomy, has scarring, you're not having to dissect the subdural space to then put a grid in. Uh, where is this? You're just putting um, your electrodes straight in. The electrode itself is only uh, 0.8 millimeters, so very fine, very delicate. Um, and the uh, accuracy, um, even with uh, non-robotic, uh, your accuracy certainly, um, you can be very accurate. Um, we have unpublished data here that uh, we're well under two millimeters on all of our placements. Um, once the lead's in place, you put the cap on, tighten it, um, uh, and get a CT intra-op to make sure uh, you don't have any leads that are too far off. Um, I would say that the only thing that we've seen is sometimes you can, your depth in your lead, you you can, that can slip a little bit, um, a few millimeters, but uh, that that's really the only malplacements that we've seen. Um, once you're happy with your placement, you then 
place we put the patients in a uh, head wrap uh, and then um, they're to the ICU overnight. We get another CT scan afterwards to actually see the brain window, uh, make sure there's no uh, hemorrhage, um, and then uh, you can start monitoring. Once um, the um, electrodes are in place, you're going to do the same as any um, monitoring session, same as video EG, uh, where the day after you would start uh, weaning uh, seizure medications to then try and have a seizure uh, to record that seizure. Uh, and uh, you're also doing uh, video at the same time to see if the clinical onset matches your electrical onset. There, um, typically, this, at least here, it's usually about a week when these leads are in place. Once they're in place, you want uh, the patient to have several seizures that you've then recorded, and you also want that to be the patient's typical seizure. Um, you don't want them um, to come in um, and have, uh, say, they have several um, absent seizures um, that don't really bother them a month, but, but you're trying to capture, say, uh, uh, their, more comp their more typical seizure. You want to see the typical seizure and then um, see that electrical activity uh, before you're happy with that. Um, the longest I think we've ever kept leads was one gentleman that uh, it was for three weeks. Um, but that, that is, is rare. Stimulation with these electrodes is um, certainly more difficult than uh, subdural. Uh, I don't know if, if you, any of you have a chance and uh, you're at a center where you're doing epilepsy surgery and you have somebody with a grid in, uh, go with a neurologist or neurosurgeon to see the mapping. Uh, it's very interesting. Um, and um, uh, it gives you, and then you can draw out on the cortex, where speech is, where motor is, how that relates, uh, and then relate that to your uh, either seizure onset epileptogenic area, or uh, uh, some places will will even do these for tumors. Um, but with stereo EG, it's a little more difficult uh, because you're dealing you're not dealing with an easily described cortical surface. You're dealing with a depth, and so as you stimulate across that depth, um, it's difficult to use that at least from a, as a surgical standpoint to use that as um, uh, a definitive test of function because you're stimulating across multiple white matter paths and it's certainly not the same as a grid. So they're stimulating for functionality and then there's also stimulating to evoke a, or to cause a seizure. This was the technique of finding the epileptogenic zone um, by uh, the Penfield use where you do a craniotomy, keep the patient awake and stimulate until you cause their seizure well, that's the place. Um, and some centers do advocate that this is, if you can cause a seizure, stimulate an area, and cause their typical clinical and electrographic seizure, that is a high predictor that that uh, removal of that area will then um, result in seizure freedom. Um, I think certainly uh, some people are a little wary about causing or evoking, or I'm sorry, uh, provoking seizures. Uh, in patients, um, and certainly you would want to do that if you were going to do that at the end of their um, hospitalization. Um, but um, but that, that that's not across all centers, but some centers do advocate that. Um, after you have enough information uh, from your leads, it's a very quick procedure to take those out, go to the operating room, light sedation, leads are out in about uh, five, maybe 10 minutes patient stays one more night and then goes home. The nice part about stereo EG or the depths is that everything's collected, uh, the leads are removed, the patient goes home, and everything can then be reviewed in a relaxed manner and um, discussed in epilepsy conference. With a grid, once you have a grid in, when you take that patient back to remove that grid, you're removing the credit, your uh, one for mapping purposes and two, you're not you, you're not going to remove that grid and then talk about it and then go back six weeks later to do a resection. You're going to do it right then. So to have a very in-depth, informed consent with the patient and their family, uh, stereo EG allows you to do that. In addition to a more thorough, potentially evaluation of the data. So that is something that certainly um, people are are fond of. Uh, once you do decide uh, if a surgical treatment is appropriate uh, or, or could be beneficial, 
then you can come back and, and, and do that. We wait six weeks to allow any contamination from the previous procedure to have resolved, and then you can do a surgical intervention if, if indicated. Once again, with the stereotactic placement, this leaves, um, it dovetails or, or fits nicely with a lot of our stereotactic treatments, whether it's stimulation uh, with RNS or whether it's uh, laser ablation, because you just go back, you use the same trajectory you had on your initial plan, and you can do your ablation if needed. And so um, these are, uh, this is really, I'm sure you guys have heard this before, but a time where stereotaxis and, and epilepsy are, are really going hand in hand. So when do you use, or what are the advantages of subdural and, and SEG? We talked about uh, reoperation. If someone's already had a craniotomy, there's published literature to show that it is more dangerous to do a subdural grid. You have a higher risk of hemorrhage. If uh, people have hard to access areas or deep areas, so paraventricular heterotopias, those you're not gonna see with a grid. If they have, um, say, uh, mesial, frontal, parietal, once again, it can putting inner hemispheric grids in can be a little challenging, whereas accessing that with stereo EG is very easy. So those would be areas where certainly stereo EG uh, has advantages. With subdural grids, the, the clear advantage there is mapping eloquent areas, more difficult with stereo EG. So is it safe? Um, I'm not sure. Has, can I see a show of hands? How, how many people have seen this uh, at their center? Has anybody seen it? You guys have all seen it. Do you get, does it bother you all that you're drilling into the skull and you don't see anything, any vessels? Maybe not. If you're if you if this is you're just used to it and everything's fine, uh, maybe you don't you know maybe it doesn't bother you. But certainly the uh, one of the epilepsy surgeons when I was a resident when he saw it he said um, this is madness this is a cult uh, why would you do that um, and uh, and the, the if you're used to looking at the brain and not hitting things just drilling straight into the brain and sticking electrodes, the question would be, is that safe? And so uh, this is a meta-analysis uh, from Dr. Mullins. He's also was at Cleveland Clinic. Um, and uh, they looked at 30 studies, 2,000, uh, up or more than 2,000 patients, and they found that the surgical, the surgical morbidity was 1.3%. It was something, um, but the risk was 0.6% risk of a um, permanent neurological deficit. And we'll get into that a little bit. So there's a 0.6% risk that you will have a permanent neurological deficit. So that's not zero. Um, that's almost with one in 200 patients uh, will have, could have a permanent neurological risk. And so similar paper, it's almost the same paper uh, out of uh, University of Cincinnati. They looked at subdural grids. And they found uh, all sorts of risks uh, that we all know, patients with grids. When patients have grids in, if they're children, it's a lot of mass effects. You can have um, hemorrhage, uh, and and uh, you can have infection. They're always leaking CSF a lot of times, and so the risk was certainly uh, higher overall. Um, from and then a three percent risk of unanticipated surgery, uh, but uh, uh, from subdural grips. But the but the difference here is, I think it's uh, like all minimally invasive techniques. It's great until it isn't. Um, and uh, it's very slick until something goes wrong. Uh, whereas this, when you're putting in a stereo EEG, if you get a hemorrhage, it's gonna be an intraparenchymal hemorrhage, likely. You, can, you could get a subdural hemorrhage. But if you get a hemorrhage, it's gonna be a, from a depth electrode, and so you get an intraparenchymal hemorrhage. So there's the, I think that's the difference. Whereas if you're doing any open procedure, usually the things are up front, you see them, and while in, say, a subdural uh, a grid, you may have a hematoma, uh, but it's gonna be a, probably a subdural hematoma that'll grow over time, and then you have to take that out. But the chance for permanent deficit was about the same, maybe at least on this paper, a little higher uh, for stereo EG. So does it work? I think that's a hard, uh, with any epilepsy technique, it can be uh, hard to standardize and look at, but this uh, was one of the papers from Cleveland Clinic where they looked at their one-year follow-up for 200 patients that had undergone stereo EG, and what they found was at uh, one-year follow-up, 68% uh, of the patients were seizure-free. That is one-year follow-up, and if you look at all of the reported case series of stereo EG patients that then uh, went on to resection at somewhere before 44 and 68%. I would say as you go on with any epilepsy patients, 
more people have seizures, so 68% at one year, that's certainly gonna go down at two years. But if you look at the published data for people that used subdural grids, it's around 50%, so probably about the same. So I always like to, where are we on this curve as far as uh, adaptation? You know, this is an, actually an old technique, uh, yet with uh, the advent of robotics and uh, the popularity in North America, this has really taken off. Um, I saw even in some, well, I won't say where, but a smaller hospital I'm familiar with, uh, I, there was an article in the local paper that they had gotten a Rosa robot, and I thought, wow, this is really, this is really gone prime time. So um, we're, uh, we're not, I think that the tolerability of this procedure and the information that it gives you, whether it's better or not than uh, subdural uh, electrodes, it certainly um, is something that uh, patients tolerate very well uh, and we're able to get uh, excellent information with it. So this is uh, something that's uh, certainly gonna be part of any institution that's doing uh, epilepsy surgery. So looking forward, we'll show you uh, some of the technical parts in the lab. Does anybody have any questions? Okay, great, thanks so much.